Hi there, Dave Levine here. Thanks for joining me for episode five of the Sports Stories podcast. Last week, we had Natalie Henderson as our special guest. Natalie gave some great insights into working in a football academy and also in the England women's football setup. Natalie also shared some of the key moments that helped her progress in her career. Today's guest will also share some of the key moments that helped progress his career. Our special guest is Colin Wilson. He's vastly experienced and has a great insight into the world of sport. Colin has been involved in sport as a player, a coach, an administrator and a consultant and has experienced sport throughout his life through many different lenses. Colin started off as an England junior table tennis player and achieved over 100 caps. He's also been the founder of a business consultancy agency called Business Athlete. Colin continues to support organisations and individuals fulfil their potential and there's nothing more that he'd like to do is to help our listeners today. So without saying too much more, I'd like to wish a very warm welcome to our special guest, Colin Wilson. Welcome to the uh, Sports Stories podcast, Colin. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you. I was reflecting back, I think I've known you now and worked alongside you for over 20 years. You're kidding, Is it go, do we go back that far? We do go back that far. I've always really valued your insights, your inspiration, your support, your challenge. And I've also come to know you so well in terms of all of the, uh, the, the, the highs and the lows and the, um, the direction that you've travelled through your career. It's always been a, a, a cause of curiosity for me because you've done so many wonderful and weird things along the way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really delighted to have you with me today to share your story, your direction through your career. But can I kick us off by starting off with your very first memory or where you um, recall being first involved with sport? Because, you know, those early years are a, a real interest for me because I think there is a foundational part to who we are. So your first recall of sport, Colin. Yeah, well, pleasure to be with you, Dave, and nice to be talking with you again after a short while. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we go back a long way, don't we? But uh, first, first thoughts about sport. Well, the obvious thing to go for is that I started playing table tennis, which was my sport and is my sport still, you know, it's my kind of specialist sport, uh, when I was just nine. Uh, but if you go a little bit more general than that, um, my first recollection of something sporty was learning to ride a bike. Right. And and the significance of it, I think, has stuck with me throughout because my dad, caring, blunt, Yorkshireman, Sheffielder, like all my family, um, and uh, I got to, my brother, big brother had a bike, and then it was time for me to learn to ride a bike. He decided so, and I was well up for this. So he got me on the driveway, little driveway, and then you just go down the driveway and you just kind of bear right into the road. So he waited till there's no cars coming. We're on a very quiet estate, and uh, I sat on this bike. And he says, "You ready?" I went, yes. And then without realizing it, he just pushed me from behind, just gave me a massive push. And there I was just going down the short drive. And then, of course, I've got a right hand bend to do to get onto the road. And uh, I tried to make this bend and uh, wobble, wobble, fell over, scraped my knee, bit of blood, really angry at my, really hurt. Secondly, really angry at my dad for chucking me in the deep end. And, uh, and uh, I've got tarmac in my, in my leg. And uh, so I went running back with this bike. I think I'm. I wasn't really, I wouldn't have been six, I'd have been less than six, wouldn't I? Maybe three. And uh, but I remember it. And I was big and grown up like six. <laughs> so um so I went back and he goes he goes, Oh sorry, sorry, he says uh, yeah, didn't didn't, didn't realise. Yeah. He says, uh, he says, Come here. So he, he got the bike and he got me and he got me standing there and started talking me through how the bike works. And he says, So what you do is you know, he says, right, okay, so sit on it that like that. So sit on it like that, naively. <laughs> and he went, right. And he went, push, and he just pushed me again. And I went flying down the driveway, just about managed to stabilize it because it accelerated from, from, from his push. Got my, got my little legs going, and I came up to the corner. I was terrified of this corner because I just failed on it a minute ago and hurt myself. I've got, still got a little bit of blood running down my leg, little graze. And I just, just, just made it around the corner without hitting the curb and then went up the road. And I just thought, crikey, how am I going to turn around and come back? And there's a kind of a little L shape where there was another another road. Again, he checked, checked the time. It was really quiet. And I managed to get around this L. So I knew how to do a, a UE. Right. And I did a U-turn and came back. And I went flying past my dad on the road. He was standing, standing in the driveway. And I looked across and I grinned. I went, I've shown you, I've shown you. And of course. 
he was showing he was showing me mm. more than I was showing yeah. him, and that's my first recollection of uh, of getting involved in sport. And then I can, you can get me off my bike. I was up and going through the woods and down to the shops and out onto the estate and up to the main road, but not on it. And uh, and that was all fantastic. And then when I was nine, uh, that's when I got into sport in a specialist way with my table tennis. So um, yeah, my dad big influ- big influence on me, and that's a typical example of what he was like. Yeah, and threw you in at the deep end, eh? <laughs> Not for the first time, yeah. And how stupid was I second time around to trust him? But um, but he he was more right than I was. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and, and clearly an, an impact on your um, life, that, that early stage and, and how you were introduced to sport and activity. Yeah, that was, the, that was the treatment. That was the expectation. You know, you get on with it. You pick yourself up. You go again. Um, things are not necessarily going to kill you that you're scared of. Um, and uh, and I got my big brother to keep me in my place as well, so I could aim for him aspirationally, and he could um, he could knock me back, yeah. and then I'd have to to get over things and go again. So yeah, all the resilience stuff I think was uh, was stuck in there at an early age, and I think in some ways, you know, someone says, "Oh, resilience," um, you know, someone's good with resilience. There are a thousand there are a thousand aspects and splinters to resilience, and I don't think anyone's anyone's got all the splinters right i think there are ways in which we are resilient and other ways in which we've got our own room 101s and um i've probably still got mine and uh, in other ways people would say i'm very resilient so um we're all a we're all a huge mix but that certainly showed me some ways to uh to uh to live and survive and progress and overcome I've always, you know, part of my interest in, in disability sport has always been around um, the principle of, of overcoming and what can be overcome. And I've always, I've always in, been impressed, emotionally very impressed by people who overcome adversity. Brilliant. And Colin, you've given us a real solid introduction to yourself and I, I'm always keen for our listeners to get to know uh, my guest um can you can you expand from there and tell me a little bit more about them how you progressed through your career through to today okay uh well uh, it's quite a while now I'm getting old <laughs> and uh but um yeah table tennis player through and through so I went to school did the homework that I had to do but I'll be down the table tennis club nearly every night for the next 15 years different clubs that if I've moved or moved house or whatever but basically you know get down the club get some practice in I remember dad saying what do you do what do you want to do on your birthday and I said let's get down the club I want Steve Steve to practice with me I'll improve my back end whatever um uh Christmas day you know what should we do I get it so all the presents and everything fantastic gets to about two o'clock in the afternoon uh any chance we can go down the club and uh so dad would end up being a key holder and he'd take us to a little rundown little shack where we could have a game and um and i could uh, i could keep playing so just really really keen um managed to play and uh, get uh, picked for england juniors by the time i was 12 or 13 um i was England number one or two from the edge of 11 um and uh, really grateful for the parental support that cart me all around the country every every weekend um and uh so i played in five european youth championships five consecutive years won a european bronze medal about the same time i was got picked for the seniors and played in the commonwealth championships uh won two commonwealth silver medals um but didn't actually make it as a successful senior international because it's it's tough there's only there's only three spots right and i was just i was just about top 10 and I was picked on potential and I got managed to get a couple of silvers, um, but that wasn't enough to be a superstar. And uh, I went to university, which didn't harm me at all, uh, table tennis wise, I studied economics and statistics, um, and uh, then got offered the job, as you do, you're doing the milk round or the recruiters come around. I got, uh, got offered a job as a trainee chartered accountant and then realized that I really wanted to continue my table tennis at age 20, 21, and uh, went to Sweden and trained out there. Played British League with uh, Matthew Syed, Desmond Douglas. You know, played in te- played in teams with them and, and won senior British League with them. Um, and uh, yeah, wonderful journey. Learned so much in Sweden. It was unbelievable. Um, and then retired when I was sort of 24, 25. Few injuries and also realised I wasn't going to earn much money or play for England regularly. Um, so then I got into sort of teaching, coaching, and consulting, and that's kind of got into more versions of that. Worked for the governing body for many years being on the board of the governing body and a generation beyond that um 
and then um, got into um, got into learning and development and coaching more coach development uh, around business as well as in sport. So it was a, it was a fairly easy jump for me to be to be used as a coach and consultant in business using what I felt I'd learned around around uh, systems and leadership and dynamics. So I've always been interested in that side of things. Wow. You, you, you continue to uh, um, blow me away, actually, with a variety of um, experiences that you've had. And, and I, I, I want to throw it back to you in a sense of through all of these experiences, and you've mentioned the word sort of resilience and um, really sticking at things and pick, picking up opportunities. Are there any particular phrases or quotes that have underpinned your journey through, through all of these um, lovely experiences that you've had that really helped you? Um, well, as you know, uh, my little brand with, uh, with Rosie and, and, and a few others and yourself is business athlete. And, uh, and a strap line to business athlete is winning without losing. And since we coined that in 2004, I believe, um, that stuck with me the whole time. It means more than one thing. Winning without losing doesn't just mean winning at everything and never losing. That's not what it's about. It's about you know in a very basic way it's about not looking for a win with such focus in one narrow area of life that you're losing out in other areas of life so yes let's be focused let's have that lifestyle immersion let's have that obsession that high performance sport can get us into but let's not lose sight of who we are let's not lose sight of what life is all about and let's, um, if we're working with, with people in business, let's make sure that they are not winning in business and losing in life. And, uh, and that's one of the mantras that I've tried to do and picking up from, you know, unashamedly from Jim Lur, who was sports, uh, sports psychologist at the Nick Bolletieri Tennis Centre and wrote um, with others um, and uh, created the corporate athlete in the States. Um, and Stephen Covey, of course, one of my one of my heroes um, in t- terms of leadership guru. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, I know him, and I know about his sort of faith background and everything as well. Um, and they came up with the concept of integrating physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and we use that so often. Um, and it seems to be very very useful for a lot of people. And right now, in the situation that we're in, talking now on on uh, online. On video, um, I think the integration of those four areas is uh, is even more poignant and prescient than it's as, as it's ever been. Colin, can you give us a, a really strong example of when you've used that mantra uh, and brought it to life in a, a in a, an area of success for you in your career? You know, a real <laughs> life story. Um, I think I learned a lot of the underpinnings of this many years ago. Yeah. Um, well before the new millennium when I was a table tennis player, when I went to Sweden okay. and their philosophy around learning yeah. and uh, Yogi Breisner, who's Swedish and working in the UK sports system uh, as an eventing coach, not just any old eventing coach, but you know, serious medal winning bloke. And we are talking about my experiences afterwards. We, we worked together, but he's, he is Swedish and in the sports system. And, uh, and he said, uh, yeah, there's one way that, uh, I, that, that I can explain it to, to British and other, and, other, and other aggressive societies around performance and learning. He said, in, um, he says, my son goes to school and they say, when he goes back to school after doing his homework, they say, Breisner, and little Breisner stands up. <laughs> says, uh, um, and in England, he said, um, okie doke, um, here was your, this was your homework. What were your answers to your homework? And he'd give the answers to the homework and they'd be yeah. right or wrong. And then they'd put on the blackboard some of the corrections and things. And that would be some teaching and that would be all fine. And that was good. He says, in Sweden, he said, um, he said uh, when I went to school, he said, Breisner. And so he'd stand up and said, Breisner, what did you learn from doing your homework last night, Breisner? Right. And there was a, just a little emphasis on learning and reflection. We talk about the Scandinavians being reflective 
type yeah. of people. Yeah. And uh, in my experience, that's largely true culturally. I've worked with with uh, at, at Nokia in leadership development there with the, with the, with the Nokia group, future yeah. leaders. And they do tend to be. I was on the phone on a group group phone call with them and uh, I asked a question and the group went quiet and um, and the person who was uh, was uh, the recipient of the question just went quiet. And this is Finnish now rather than rather than Swedish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and after a couple of minutes, I'm thinking, okay, it's, everything's gone a bit dead. Let's check the technology. Um, uh, are you still are you still are you still there, Marty? And, uh, and Marty came back and just went thinking. Right. <laughs> in other words, give me time to think. Yeah. You know, there's n- there's not nothing going on here. The work is being done in the mind. Yeah. And it was just very quiet on the phone. For everyone else, it's really normal. And I held off as long as I dared yeah. as a you know, Western, you know, British American yeah. style. Um, uh, but I just thought the line had gone dead. And uh, so I thought I needed to check it out. But I didn't. You know, they were just thinking that was expected. And they came back with an answer. I can't remember what it was, but it was really thoughtful, really insightful. Took the conversation in a bit of a different direction. And uh, people got results that no individual would have come up on their own. So I learned a lot from that kind of reflective um, style. But also the combination of um, real nurture and brutal accountability. And that combination, I thought, I thought that was a dilemma and opposites. And what I learned was that you can actually build those together and make it an and, not an or. And I don't see that commonly, but I do see it in some environments. And I'm always very, very impressed when I see that implemented successfully. So, so Colin, you, you've, you've picked my interest there with the nurture and accountability, because I think for our listeners, that would be a really interesting kind of um, comparison. Or how, how do we use that together? Or can you, can you get, share an example or a story where that's really come to life as well? Because I, I just think it's such a powerful um, well, concept. Yeah, and, and, and it's not fair to put people under the microscope too much. But if, in my own family, as you know, I've got two, two boys. Yeah. Um, they both play. One's a fantastic little coach, um, just coming out of his teens, uh, and also a very good player, top 200 in the country. And the younger one is uh, is trying to play full time. Uh, funnily enough, they're playing full time now in Sweden. Surprise, surprise. Uh, only age 19, and they're just making their making their way. Um, but uh, little Sam was always quite focused and quite single minded. Yeah. Uh, more so than Adam, who was more kind of. Um, more spacey and more sherry. Um, but the younger one was a bit like that. And I thought, okay, let's go, let's go with this. So, um, so in terms of accountability and, uh, and nurture, I just thought, well, if he's going to be good, table tennis is a fairly early specialization sport. So you can't afford to let him get to 16 years old, messing around, having some fun, playing two or three sessions a week, etc. cetera. Um, and at that point he goes, dad, I'd like to be fantastic at this sport. And I'll go, it's too late. So I realized he had some ability and he had some focus and he was enjoying himself. And so I thought, I've got to, I've got to raise this when I, at a young age. So he was uh, 10 or 11. And I thought, how do I do this? And I just found um, Pete Chartis, who is, uh, who is uh, referenced widely now as, uh, as Matthew Syed's. Uh, coach so you'll know Matthew Syed from writing in the times and writing books rebel ideas and bounce and flat box thinking and uh, and Matthew was an old training partner of mine and uh, and uh, actually he was in his corner coaching him occasionally because he was the next generation down from me and I was still involved in uh, in coaching national teams Um, and he always cites Pete and Pete was it was his who was his coach and um uh, at a young age, and a defence coach. And Matthew was a defensive player, and Sam was turning into a defensive player. So I, I turned him over to Pete and I said, "Look, Pete, you know we can't keep this guy up to the table. He wants to go back. Let's let's make a good defensive player out of him." Yeah. We've since ditched the term defensive because you know putting backspin on the ball and being away from the table, there is nothing defensive about what Sam does. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all it's all for a purpose and it's all aggressive. <laughs> yeah. um, so when people call him a defender, I think nah, it's not quite the right expression for it. Yeah. <laughs> but when he was very very young and 11 he said okay i said sam do you want to give this a go and he was enjoying being with pete and um and it's great to see you know sam coming up as a second generation after after matthew if you like another sort of 20 years later on and uh, and pete was still still enough beans in him and so such enthusiasm and so such focus towards um helping people to reach their potential as performers and so i said to sam 
you know, if you want to be good at this, I said, dude, how good do you want to be? And he said, I'd like to be very good. I said, okay, well, let's pretend then that you're going to play in the Olympics in Paris 2024. We didn't know it was Paris at the time. We didn't know, even know it was Tokyo in 2020. But I just said, you know, whenever it is. We, we, I think we knew it was Rio. We knew it was Rio 2016 coming up. We had that, we had that venue. But the next one wasn't ready yet. Um, so I said, look, imagine it's Rio again and you're going to go to the Olympics. I said, um, how about then, if you want to be good, I'll show you what it takes to be good. So we need to have a proper program. We need to focus. And of course, I don't want to put a kid through this for the next 10 years if they're you know, not into it particularly. Yeah. I said, well, tell you what, let's do it for two weeks, 11-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, little, little bear. Yeah. And uh, I said, should we do it for two weeks? And I'll show you how to develop as a top towards being a top player. He goes, yeah, okay, I'll do that. So I pick him up from work from school myself, drive him across to, to Kingfisher, put him, put him with Pete, play with him, play with him myself, go through the program, do the things. And, uh, and he was responding to it well and working hard. And he realized that this was a thing, you know, to actually train seriously. Yeah. And, uh, he was, he was sweating away and enjoying himself. And I did that for two weeks with him and I went, oh, okay, how was that? And he says, yeah, it's okay. I said, well, if you want to, we could do it for another two weeks, but it's completely up to you. Totally up to you. But if you want to, we'll do another couple of weeks and then just see how it goes. And the term, we'll see how it goes, just happened every, every couple of weeks. Every couple in, of weeks. Throughout, throughout, throughout the next three or four years. Um, yeah, no, and actually, yeah, throughout the next couple of years. So it evolved yeah. over time. Yeah, yeah. But I just thought, how do I get him, um, how do I give him the opportunity without the pressure? Right. And that's how we got to this kind of nurture and accountability stuff. And I said, anytime you want to step off, that's absolutely fine with me. Not worried at all. But every two weeks he went, yeah, okay, I'll do it again. But I think the fact that he didn't have this long-term pressure and he was just doing it as a trial, just doing it for fun, it was, it was emergent for him. That was, yeah. that was great. And, and the accountability was there maybe for the two weeks, so it was short bursts with a, a get out if needs be, so we could re- yeah. we continue to review along the way. Yeah, so we weren't we weren't trying to get to to the Olympics in 2024. Yeah, we were trying to have a play at experiencing what it's like to be preparing for something yeah. just for a fortnight. Yeah, and then we repeated it and we repeated it and repeated it because he wanted to, yeah. and uh, and then after a while he got on a track. He then got sick actually for three and a half years. Didn't have any social, any education, or any exercise for three and a half years, which was heartbreaking. You feel helpless as a dad when he's got chronic pain um, and other issues. Um, so that was, that was horrible. Um, but uh, eventually he got over it. We didn't know if he ever would. And he was just hurting and he wasn't able to, uh, to do much at all. Um, but uh, when it faded away and he came back to it, he, um, he took to it again. And then by then, of course, he'd had a good education in, in what to do to, to pick it up and to to renew renew the interest. Wow! So you, you continue to keep his interest and his enthusiasm and his passion for the sport. You know, so before he were, before he became ill, he he was enjoying it, and then afterwards he could pick it up again because he hadn't been um, drilled or taken to a place where he didn't enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, and and to be you know, in terms of the adult having an influence yeah. and, and and being influential. Um, and having their own thoughts yeah he was was he predisposed yes was he potentiated for this absolutely but it was done in a in a consensual way with a very young with a very young mind and body yeah. that uh, that you want to nurture and care for yeah so Colin, if, if I move us on to a, the kind of the flip side of the coin in terms of uh, your lovely mantra about winning winning without losing um, it's been a time in your career or in your life that you can ref- take us to whereby you, it was a pretty challenging time and a, a low patch and where that, that mantra actually really helped you come through it and out the other side of it. And, and if so, how? Mm. Well, I didn't really learn it until I learned part of it when I was away in Sweden. I wasn't away in Sweden much, only a matter of weeks for a couple of years. Um, but it had a big impression. You know, I don't, don't think I've lived out there for a year at a time or anything like that. I didn't. Yeah. But it was an amazing time in my sport because they were gearing up to win the world, to beat China for the World Men's Team Championships, which they ended up ended up succeeding in doing, which was just a revelation to many, but we'd kind of seen all the preparation. 
Yeah. So I think the, the winning without losing didn't come till later. You know, I was right, already okay. yeah, I yeah. was already in my thirties, forties, um, when that really kind of hit home for me. Yeah. Um, and I was doing a lot of uh, coach coach development, leadership development, coaching yeah. system development with a with yeah. with a, a range of uh, a range of people. Yeah. Um, but a, a tough time where I think I needed it was, um, as you know, and I've still got the. You're looking at me on the video screen. I've got my Corby Smash t- table tennis shirt. Yeah, on. I've noticed that's great. <laughs> and uh, and we're doing we're doing well, and it's a part time club for me. And I threw lots of stuff into it, um, lots of money into it, lots of time, emotion, energy into it, and, and alongside others as well. Um, and it's still going, which is great. But um, yeah, it took chunks out of me to get it to get it going. You know, mm-hmm. emotionally and physically and and yeah. financially. And I'm very proud of what we've achieved. And um, yeah, it, we're we're ticking over, but there were times in building that. So this is more of a kind of business story, really. It was yeah. always going to be not. It's always going to be a non-profit, but we hopefully we were hoping that we were going to get paid for the effort we put into it, yeah. um, but not distribute sort of profitable dividends outside of the organisation to directors, kind of thing. Yeah. So kind of a semi-commercial non-profit, yeah. um, and it was taking chunks out of me. And we weren't getting the people through the door, especially in the daytimes that we were hoping for. Yeah. Um, so having put a massive effort into it, I mean, a big marketing um, effort, uh, but also you know marketing you know issues, and um, and the finances were were going down. I'm just chucking chucking more in, and it's and it's hurting, really hurting. I'm not yeah. getting the time to do my other my other work, and it's kind of it's kind of clouding everything and taking over. Yeah. Um, even though what was happening there was great, yeah, and it just wasn't growing fast enough to to uh, to add up. But yeah. then. I got my kids as well that were, I, I didn't do it for the kids at all. At the time that I set up Corby Smash, um, neither of the kids were playing or interested. Yeah. Um, Sam was ill. It was the last thing from his mind that he'd ever play again. Um, and Adam was just a recreational player. He just liked a little hit every now and again. That was all. Um, but they both gravitated back uh, after I opened it and after it was getting difficult financially. So that was another reason why I thought I've just got to keep this thing going and I've got to get it to a place where we can, we can make it survive into the long term. And and as I say, now it's a spare time activity for me. We've got the community, it is running. um, And the kids have had a very, very important and formative two or three years um, with the facility there, which we've now moved to a, a smaller place. But that it was it was very very difficult, and I've said to people a few times, if I didn't know, if I hadn't known my business athlete principles, and yeah. if I hadn't been able to to integrate those four energy capacities, yeah. I would have uh, I would have either had to pack it up early, yeah, and just go, I can't do this, it's going to fail, or I would have been dead in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> Just from just from burnout. So I think I've avoided. I'm um, pretty active type, as you know, and I think I've avoided burnout quite a few times. And I've seen executives struggle, and I run pre work pre burnout workshops for people that are heading in that direction. And I really, really understand that that coming over burnout is is difficult because there's a tra- there's a traumatic effect that's happened in your brain. Yeah. And um, by the time you've got proper burnout, that that is that is always going to leave scars and and um, and is very 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 difficult to overcome fully for quite a significant period later but i knew what i knew and i knew how far i could push myself if you like with the pressures of the of what was going on and it was like can i pay the mortgage it was Mm -hmm. you know am i looking after the missus okay Mm -hmm. um are the kids healthy uh is my are my couple of employees all right and uh yeah big big issues around one of the one of the things i find hard are serious financial pressures and i think i've had them at least twice in my life I've had periods and it's not comfortable for me. I don't want to, some people don't, some people don't care if they, if they lose money uh, or if they go bust or whatever. And, and while I recognize that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's families in in Africa that have got bigger bigger things to worry about. As my dad would say, you know, you've got people worse off than you. I don't want to let people down in that way. And I don't want to lose everything if I don't have to. And uh, there were some dark days, um, and eventually, of course, you come around. And but at the time, you don't know you're going to come around. Yeah. But I think it was the the understanding of of performance and balance together yeah. that enabled me to go. 
you know what, I think we can keep stepping forward and get through this, through the dark times. And, and Colin, what you, what you really give to me here, though, is the sense of, you know, you, you've talked about your business athlete principles, um, but it's not about knowing. It's actually you've really applied them. You've really had to bring them to life and, and kind of take some of your own medicine. So as a, as a developer of <laughs> others, you know, you've really had yes. to apply them to your own world. And, and I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm always quite curious as to kind of the, the real deep feelings that those times evoked. Um, mm. what, what, what were your lasting feelings around that time? Well, it gets to a point where you just in, you just get to your mantra is survival. But I think, as Viktor Frankl would say, you know, you choose your values at, at a time like that. I'm not saying that my, my situation or conditions were as serious as many, many others have. You know, we talk about, we're talking about a ping pong club, you know. Um, but for me, it was, it was, it was tough. I was, it yeah. was in, in danger of losing a lot. Uh, well, more than everything that I had and all that jazz. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I wanted to keep it going. I still had the aspiration and there were some fantastic people around me. So I think really for me, it was, it was just a case of, of knowing what value, knowing who I was going to be each yeah. day and living that. And the people close to me would have seen some ragged edges at times. You know, They would have seen me struggling. They would have seen me... Yeah, upset they would have there's times when i wasn't able to pay the wages on time mm. that was embarrassing for me mm. you know um those sorts of things were i found i found difficult how, yeah how, how did you work out who you wanted to be because you, you gave me there a, a clue is that that was one of the things that really helped pull you through this mm. well i had to be there's a lot there was a lot to do and and that's um, a great team yeah around me as well putting a deserving people around me but ultimately i i was responsible um so i think i decided very clearly what my values were and we right. we, we did a values exercise on the club brilliant and i've been in corporates and we've done values yeah, exercises yeah, and really. workshop facilitation and you know we've got to get it down to five values from this list of 36 that everyone in the room <laughs> thinks is important we've all kind of been there done that um, and do they, and, and do we, are we really going to lose them anyway? And all the, all the usual corporate stuff around that. But when we came to, um, when we came to the club, we decided, um, and it ultimately, um, I decided with, with help that, um, we only had one value. I thought this is quite different to, uh, yeah. to, 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 to what I preach in terms of, you know, getting to a small number of tight values. We had one value, um, thinking about, what we were doing with the community and everything and, and yeah. kids come off the streets and what have you. And, and it was respect. And there was, there was a kind of an one A, one B and one C. So the value was respect. And one A was respect for self. Number two was respect for others, for all others, respect for all others. And number three was respect for the environment, whether that's not smashing a ball around because you're frustrated or bashing the net or whatever, yeah. uh, shaking hands with the umpire at the end of a game, all of those sorts of things. So respect was the only, and I just thought, I just thought, right, what's the next value? And the one after that, and I just went, hang on a minute, that's it. We're there. Yeah. Um, so I just decided that I was going to respect myself no matter what happened, <laughs> that I was going to respect all others no matter what happened. And there'll be people who will watch this and go, well, Colt, you're a bit flipping ragged with me at some points. And that would have been the pressure of the task and the pressure of the, yeah, the role at times. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll put my hand up to that. But I think underneath, I've managed to to uh, remain a decent human being. Yeah. Um, and third one, respect for the environment. So to, to try really hard to hold on to this, uh, to hold on to this, this venue for as long as I could until I realized that we needed to move somewhere that was uh, that was easier to, to manage. Yeah. And to try and keep the venue iconic. So I'd continue to invest in the flooring being the best in the country, the lighting being the best in the country. So you could run you could run a world championship or Olympic championship final there. Um, and so anybody could 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 understand what decent decent quality experience was. And we'd have Adam working as a host and Henry and Tony coaching and you know, fantastic stuff. You know, well done, well done them. And um and uh, and so, yeah, I was hanging on to that. Yeah. I was hanging on to that. 
And you paint a lovely picture for me in terms of that three-legged stool again, in terms of balancing off the self, the other, and the environment and keeping a nice balance between them all. Because I guess yeah. you have to look after yourself here as well as look after the people and the, uh, the club, as well as also yeah. making sure the environment was as, as professional and as quality as you would like. And I, I can see there's a, yeah. a nice healthy balance. I, and I sense that that's what pulled you through by keeping that check in, in place. Mm. Is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, well, one of the things I learned from Robin Shohei in, in, in facilitation, he's a wonderful coaching supervisor, um, he's written widely with, uh, with uh, you know, some of the leading leadership thinkers. And uh, I always remember in one of the supervision sessions, he says, when you walk in as a, as a workshop facilitator in a serious corporate environment, he says, you don't have the luxury of being self-conscious. Yeah. You don't have the luxury of going in with doubt. And I just thought, this sounds like boxing to me. <laughs> you know, if you're a boxer, you don't have the luxury of going, oh, I think my chance is 60 40. You know, you've got to be, you've got to commit your brain to it. Yeah. And you, you don't have the luxury of doing that. And I think it's been a really helpful mental tip for me to work with the kids, yeah. some of the young players that we've got. Um, that uh, you know, getting nervous in a game, and every now and again, I've I've tried, I've used a little, I've used it, and it's worked. I've just said to them, "Come on, how you feeling? Oh, I'm uh, a bit nervous." Then, yeah, okay, right. Well, if you if you're going to be nervous, you're going to. I've just said, I think I can hear my dad in myself, but a bit of Robin <laughs> as well. And I say, "Well, if you're going to be nervous, you're going to lose, aren't you?" So don't bother with that. Just don't bother with it. Just go and play. And they kind of go. Some of them go, "Oh, all right then," <laughs> and that's it. And they go and they decide not to be nervous, and that's pit, bit of their brain switched off. And off they go and they perform. And I think, uh, you know, people in our kind of roles yeah. uh, have to do that yeah. at some points. You know, we know some of the things that, that uh, world-class athletes have said yeah. on the day before a major, major competition, what they've said the night before about yeah. their doubts and they didn't deserve to be there and they haven't done the training properly and they're not worthy to be around all these other athletes that they're going to compete against. And sure enough, they go and win the gold medal for Great Britain and Northern yeah. Ireland. So everyone has these doubts, yeah. but in the moment you need to transcend that, and uh, and then you know you can you can gain a, a reputation with yourself that you can go into a situation you can perform to somewhere near your potential, even though the conditions are not always going going your way. Wow. So, Colin, let me, let, I would like to move us on here, and and, and you you gave, you've you've opened the door for me in terms of um, the role that your father's played somewhat because you've mentioned mm-hmm. him a couple of times and um, you, you may wish to sort of identify a person um, or, or even a, a, a situation but I'm wondering if there's been a, an inspirational moment in your career which or your life where you can really think wow that was a massive turning point and whether it's um, a person or a scenario or a situation that you could um, talk us through that's really made a big impact on you. Okay. I think there's only one situation that I should raise above all else because some because someone met, did make a massive impact and it would be remiss not to, to mention them. And when I was coming out of the juniors and into the senior game, I wasn't going to have any more junior tournaments. I'd won the you know, bronze medal in the boys' doubles and the European youth in Poland before the Iron Curtain came down with my mate Graham. And uh, I was coming out of the juniors and, and uh, I wasn't, I was a bit directionless and a little bit arrogant. And I, so it was not a great combination. And I didn't really know that the self-awareness wasn't there. And I'd had a big hit because the, the, the powers that be at the time, the coaching performance coaching system at the time were all into, you've got to go full time. As soon as you finish your A-levels, you've got to go full time. And I looked at the university and I went, hang on a minute, you get 22 weeks off at university. And when you're there for the 30 weeks that you are there, you've only got lectures for 14 hours a week. And that goes down to 11 in the second year. So hang on a minute. You're telling me that you know, going, and get, going and getting a decent degree at University College London, which is right next door to where I can practice at St. Bride's, all the best players come around from around London, commute in and practice all day table tennis next to all the bankers, you know, that I can't do this. So they said to me, have you made a decision, Colin? And I said, yeah, I made a decision. I said, I'm going to go to UCL and do economics and statistics. And at that point, I'd been on all of the England junior camps. I'd by that stage been invited as a junior to all of the senior camps. I was playing with Desmond Douglas and all the other team members, Carl Preen. And I was, I was doing well. And I was down as potential and I was doing well. The moment that I said in this culture that I was going to go to university, yeah. I never got picked for a 
England training camp again in my life. Right. And at 17, that's quite a hit. And at the time that you're coming out of the junior events, which at that time was under 17, into the men's game only. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge, huge reset and a huge new hill to climb. So that hit me hard. Uh, but I went to university um, and I, uh, I did train well and hard with, you know, Skylar Andrew and Kenny Jackson, Graham Sandley, Philip Bradbury, Max Crimmins, all your table tennis players will remember these wonderful, wonderful players and dozens of others as well. And, um, and I just did everything I could to, uh, to put the both together. And to be honest, the only commitment I made to myself and to my parents was I'll turn up to the lectures. I'll do the 14 hours. I'm not going to promise how much work I'm going to do, in, <laughs> do when I'm supposed to be doing the other rest of the 40 because I'm going to yeah. be skipping down and playing table tennis. Right. Um, and so, uh, and so that's that's what I did, and that was that was my commitment. And I got myself a two-two. I'd like to do. I, I think I've got a few. You know, I've got a few qualifications and accreditations and everything since, as you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's always a bit of me that says, you know, go back. You know, come on, get a, get a distinction at something and get a, get a masters with a distinction because you could have done better than a two-two. Yeah. Just that I was too busy, too busy hitting little ping pong balls over six-inch nets while I was uh, <laughs> while I was there for three years. Yeah. And, and and who was the who was the inspirational person then in in that environment? Yeah. Okay, that, that's so, clearly I, played a big part of of you, you know, and 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 shows me a big sense of who you are there actually in terms of your determination to plot your own course actually. Um, yeah. But okay. Was, well, the the power behind the power behind that was Peter Hurst, right. and Peter's fairly well known around sport. I think he was chief exec of the. New Zealand equivalent of, of uh, Sports Coach UK or the Sports UK coaching now. Yes. Um, many, many years ago, table tennis player and coach himself. He was about as good as I was, played for England occasionally. Um, and, um, and he got hold of me and he says, Colin, you're coming out of the juniors. And he says, you're going into the seniors. And uh, he says, uh, what do you think your game's like looking ahead? And I went, yeah, yeah, what, are you, what are you getting at? You know, a little bit defensive. Well, I'm doing okay, you know, just got to practice hard. And he went, well, your game, is that is your game built to beat good juniors and is your game built to beat good senior players? And within about five seconds of reflection, I went, hmm. you're right. And I hadn't really thought that through fully. I didn't have that long-term perspective properly. And I thought, my game's really designed to beat very, very, very good junior players. But the senior players with the increased power Right. that they're going to have and i'm not big and they were going to a lot of them were going to have more power than me um i realized my game wasn't set up for that and he said you're going to need to make some changes aren't you yeah you're right uh and i said to uh he says are you prepared he says i'll i'll help i said great thanks a lot and i just thought here's someone probably for the first time ever that really really understands me and my game and the game against you know the, uh, the environment i'm going to be I'm going to be in. And uh, so I said to him, okay, I said, how long is it going to get take to, to go backwards, to go forwards? I know there's a restructure coming on here. Mm-hmm. So at 16, 17, I did a complete restructure of my game technically, yeah. which is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And, uh, and I said to Pete, you know, how long is it going to take to get back to where I am now albeit on the other side i'll have a better trajectory of of improvement potential and he said three years and when i tell people that they go flipping that sounds like a long time (laughs) but i thought i i looked at him and i went okay we're on and i committed to it and uh and then people say to me well how long did it take and the answer is two years so it actually took me two years to kind of get back to where i was um but then of course you're on a better trajectory um, and I, I was definitely the right thing to do, definitely improved. And people say, well, you never went to any other Commonwealth championships or games um, and you didn't uh, get in the England men's team. Well, that's true. Yeah. But I was a heck of, but it was a very, very strong time. You've got Desmond Douglas, Carl uh, Preen and Alan Cook, top, all top 40 in the world. Des is in the top five. Um, and I couldn't get into that team. I beat five of the top 10, one of them twice in one season. Right. Um, so I was there or thereabouts, but not quite good enough. Yeah. But had I stayed as I was and just gone for the incremental yeah. with, uh, with a flawed foundation, I wouldn't have been as good. So I'm really happy 
Uh, not that I became as good as I possibly could, um, that I actually reached my potential completely, but I got close enough to the top to be able to see the top right. and then to go, okay, that last bit, yeah. how high is that going to be and how long does it take to get there? And when I was 24 years old, I thought, you know what, I could put, it, I could put another two years into it yeah. and I'll get a tiny bit better. So, but is that but is that worth it? And at that point, I I decided I was going to retire. I'd already already had um, a sh- a shoulder uh, dislocation, okay. which didn't help, and I had a lower back injury that didn't help. Um, and I decided at that point that I didn't need to do the extra two years to get to the top of the mountain. But I was close enough that I was I was happy. So you raised there for me though the, the difficulty and the complexity and the challenge that this environment of trying to be a professional or a very successful table tennis player or, or do I dare say any sports person you know it mm. is a really difficult environment to progress through and yes. you know you uh, and to be successful at and therefore you know given your experiences both as a, a, an athlete uh, and also a coach and also kind of a, a leader stroke administrator in these environments. <coughs> What kind of advice might you give to somebody looking and listening to us, thinking, I'm looking at this environment, I'm, I'm interested in going through this performance or talent pathway. What, what advice would you give to a, an aspiring athlete or a parent trying to support their children? As I know you, you're supporting your children through this as well. Yeah, big one. And the answer is, it, de- is, it, the answer <laughs> is it, it depends on many, many things. Well, what does it depend on? What, what, the individual what, what, or the parent. <laughs> But I think it probably depends on what age this athlete is that you want me to speak to. Okay. Because if you said to me, you know, here's a, here's a teenage athlete, what would you say to them and their parents? Yeah. And I'd say, well, if you're in a sport like table tennis or ice dance or gymnastics, and you're saying that your ambition is to be very, very good, I'd be saying, well, <laughs> you, need to start, you need to start a few years ago. So enjoy the, enjoy the journey you're on because you're probably too, too late to start in other later specialization sports. Then, um, yeah. and you, and you're speaking to someone who's younger, then you've got the opportunity of, uh, of doing what I did with Sam. Yeah. But, uh, I think the way maybe, uh, to think of it is what I'd say to the parent. I think it's the parent that's got the responsibility for the vision yeah. more than it is for the child. You don't want to burden the child with too much vision at a young age. Yeah. Uh, but what I say to the parent is, Let's get really clear about your time frame. Right. Are we talking about uh, taking it as it comes and being emerg- emergent and seeing how it goes yeah. and trying to get from club level into the county team, into a regional squad? Yeah. You know, if we're talking about a performance athlete, that's fine. But that, that approach is probably not going to take you to the top. Yeah. It may do. You may not have enough time and space, but it may not. And I, I accept that I'm coming from a, a fine motor skill sport, so, you, so it's yeah. typically more early specialization. So I'm, I'm clouded a bit by that. But generally speaking, I think it still holds. So if what kind of conversation do you want to have with your child athlete yeah. when they're 18, 19? You don't want them to be saying, I wish you'd have pushed me harder when I was younger because I would have liked to have been really good at this. And you miss the opportunity. You miss the boat. At the same time, you don't want to push a young kid that doesn't know, you know, particularly what they want in terms of their aspirations and be a pushy parent yeah. and destroy them, destroy their enjoyment and destroy their career because the parent wanted to keep that option open. So I think you need to be really clear about, about where, you, where you want to go. And 99% of the time, I think the right answer is let's not get obsessed with ultimate performance let's enjoy sport yeah. and see how it goes and build it up and we accept that we're very very unlikely to be to be representing our country or making a living or what have you um and let's just have a great time if you are however trying to keep that option open then you've got to be brutally accountable to yourselves for that mm-hmm. and to say and you know, how am i going to organize this in a way that is not damaging to the child and it's not trivial it's, it's a very very uh, fine line and it's a very very serious question but done right you can create a heck of a lot of joy throughout the whole family but what is absolutely clear to me that you that you shouldn't do it if you're doing it for the outcome you must do it if as you can only go that route if the journey alone with no outcome is worth it and it's in and of itself yeah then it's justifiable 
but you can't do it. You can't do it for the outcome and not for the journey. Yeah, there's those lovely quotes in there, you know, if we look after the process, the result will look after ourselves. And I think you're really playing to that in terms of we're working here with a, a young person's process, their journey through life. And actually, mm. if we look after that well enough and support it and nurture it, yes, and hold them accountable at certain times, but also help them work out what it's about. I get a sense of you, what you're saying is that, you know, the, the results will work out. They'll, they'll find the, the right place for themselves. Right. And at yeah. the same time, if you take my situation with Sam, I'm, you know, it's a little bit unique because I've played yeah. at a decent level and, and what have you. It's not over a parent would, would have had that previous uh, yeah. experience if it had been on a similar journey. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it was deliberate from my point of view. What was deliberate? The vision. The vision, the, the, the existence of the vision was deliberate from my point of view because I needed to know what next steps to put in place to keep this to keep this possibility alive without it being a burden to the young athletes. Yeah. So the vision is deliberate, um, but we don't want to burden the we don't want to burden the, the child with that. So uh, as, as they sometimes say in teaching, teaching is deliberate. Teaching is deliberate for the teacher, but learning is incidental for the right. learner. So they're not they don't have to worry about that. But someone, and I, if if you're saying, am I talking to a parent with an aspiring with an aspiring young athlete? Yeah, we need to get really clear on that. And then the second thing I'd say to the parent is, do you understand what it takes if you if you want to 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 keep open the possibility of becoming truly excellent at this? Because most parents, to be honest, yeah, in my experience, most parents don't have the conscious competence to actually know what that journey needs to look like it's not obvious it's not intuitive yeah. and you do you do need help from somebody that understands the pathway of sporting excellence to to help you understand what is needed and then that needs to be adhered to but in but not in a way that gets in the in the in the child's way as an interference um, to keep that pathway open Wow. So the, we offer some really great thoughts, um, some provo- provocation even, um, some guidance there for, for parents. Say that because, about me. <laughs> well, and I think that's really useful because, you know, there's a lot, lot of people and we're fortunate to have worked in this environment and understand it um, somewhat. But it's, it's, it's coming through from your conversation there, Colin, very strongly that it's a really fine balance, this, you know, and there's so many different ingredients yeah. to consider and, you know, and your very first comment around actually it depends is that is really key here depending on the sport the child the parent the relationship there's so many different ingredients um so i think you make a really valid point there but actually it's a it's it's something to go into um with your eyes open maybe and also not to take very much lightly from what you're saying and the experience very, that you've had. very very much yeah and and yet the delivery needs to be light yes we need to deliver this stuff lightly and elegantly and with fun and and with a smile yeah. and and oh and own that for ourselves that's our journey too but we yeah. just have an understanding of what's behind it too yeah well and with that point and you've got a smile on your face there i'm going to just ask us before we go into the um the, the kind of the quick fire round uh, of questions mm. i'd just like to put to you about um you know who has been probably the most influential inspirational person in your career you, you mentioned your dad you mentioned peter hurst as different people mm-hmm. is, is there somebody else that you would say has had a, a huge impact or are, are those the two key people wow um well those two are the are the, are the must do's you know yeah. if, if you're asking me about that those my dad and peter um peter hurst and dave fairhome came as a team yeah okay. so dave was a massive mentor and i was speaking to him <laughs> the day before yesterday about mentor, mentoring issues, and he's still a, a, a guru to me. It was 1984 right. when we wrote the Pocket Guide to Table Tennis Tactics together. <laughs> we, we go back a long way, and still now he's able to help me shift my brain in good direction. So, so he's another one. I, um, there are loads. There are too many to mention. If yeah, I yeah. start mentioning three or four, people may not know them, and um, okay, and no. uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, to miss out too many people what i will say is my he- my heroes are tend to be not the the, the usual suspects yeah in the in the me you know that they've got a media profile yeah um my greatest hero yeah in terms of living their life as they should to others 
um, is my cousin. My cousin, you wouldn't know in sport, doesn't play sport, um, has um, uh, um, paranoid schizophrenia and, by, and, and very serious bipolar yep. at the same time. Wow. And has had since they were a late teenager. So they've yeah. given up a lot. Yeah. And it brings a, a lump to my throat every time I think about this, yeah. about someone who just does what they need to do, yeah. adheres to what they need to adhere to, yeah. ex- has appropriate expectations of life, yeah. and makes the most of it and creates a happy life. And Len, he's got married. Yeah, he's, got two, he's, he's had two kids. They've grown up to be wonderful. His mum's still there. His dad died of chromatin neurons disease. Uh, he cared for, cared and tended for him. His mum is still alive in her 80s, and I spoke to her the other day, my auntie Barbara. Um, and it's the people like Len of this world, yeah. whether they're making you know, obvious large contributions or the smaller um, human contributions that yeah. make the fabric of society work. And, and he's just he's valuable by being who he is, not by what he does, yeah. which he, he, does, he does the doing as well yeah. you know, within the sphere that he has. But he provides the value of, uh, to to all of us in being who he is and living life in the way that he does as a as an example. I think to all of making the best of what we've got and recognizing the limitations of what's in the environment, Brilliant. and uh, and just making the best of uh, of what's on offer. And uh, and so you can talk about Richard Branson or Nelson Mandela, but I'll go for Len any time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and on that positive note of, of, of somebody really um, being who they are and being yeah. really true to themselves, I want to take us into our little quick fire round here where I'm going to ask you a number of quick Uh-oh. questions. Um, and, and, and I make think, me nervous now. Well, it, it, it's pretty simple because this is really a, a powerful part uh, of the, uh, the conversation for me in terms of really helping and giving some guidance and advice to, um, to our listeners. So, Colin, I'm going to ask you, as I say, a number of questions your gut answers, your okay. gut instincts will be great. So um, what f- maximum four books would you recommend that have really helped, inspired, and educated you along your way? Leadership Team Coaching by Peter Hawkins and Nick Smith. Nick was a personal supervisor to me, and I've done a lot of work under, under Peter. Uh, so that's a classic in terms of uh, yeah. leading and coaching teams. Um, going back to... Um, winning without losing, business athlete mantra, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual. Um, I'd say the power of full engagement by Jim Lur and others. Yeah, uh, is another classic. And then uh, a chap who was a after I finished playing table tennis, I went to help my mate, a table tennis player, Mark Mitchell, a senior international yeah. player that had a mechanics business, and I went to help him. I didn't know it was called management consultancy. <laughs> I just went to help my mate to uh, get rid of his overdraft in his little mechanics business. And he had a customer. He was in Hampstead. Um, and he had some great customers, real, it's an unbelievable, North, London Northwest Three, some amazing people there. And one of his customers was called Arnold Arnold. And Arnold Arnold had a little faded red golf CL, yeah. um, which we'd bring in for servicing. And he gave us a copy of his book and he, he wrote a book and he, it was called Winners and Other Losers in Peace and War. Right. And it was quite a thick book. It wasn't just a little article. Yeah. And I read this book and the guy's a genius. And he was just citing how by trying to win and to win against things, we just create so many losses, which then, re, which then rebound on ourselves. Right. So this was mm, well before. 2000 well before winning without losing but it was probably my first kind of introduction to the philosophy yeah of winning without losing so he called this he called his book winning without losing so that's a, is that number two that was three that's number three no, in that number three yeah of yeah. course um yeah sorry he called it winners and other losers okay brilliant and then this with a subtitle yeah, yeah. Um, in peace and war um and then i've got to go with um Glenn Doman's book, which I found at complete random and found the title of the book unbelievably challenging. And I just thought, this is either evil or fantastic. And I picked it up and had a look at it and I thought, oh, this guy's really onto something. And his name's Glenn Doman. He's in his 90s now. Um, and his book was called How to Multiply Your Baby's Intelligence. 
right and having just and and um and then having a child who was born with a brain injury which we subsequently worked to fix uh unashamedly so and learned a lot about um practical neurological yeah. development in doing so uh, with uh, with our eldest and you would never know it to this day um but knowing the this the gravity of the situation we were in yeah. having having had having read that book and knowing what to do made a, a huge difference so technology what technology really works for yours would be your go-to place whether it's um, a piece of software or a piece of technology yeah okay so two things that i find most impactful and i'm going to surprise you here without going for anything i'm not going to go for the singing and dancing yeah no good heavy heavy tech um but there's some heavy tech that does big data and all of that that is yeah. very useful. But in the end, my, my two, uh, one has been Zoom, yeah. albeit albeit with uh, with a few security issues. Yeah. Um, but they're getting they're getting there. So yeah. Zoom on group video. Um, last night I was I was uh, running a because uh, we uh, we're in lockdown at the moment. Yeah. And. Um, and uh, with this coronavirus, which uh, whenever you listen to this, you know, that will be a thing for the early part of 2020, learning to live with uh, with what's going on here. So last night I was running a, uh, a group table tennis session for my uh, intermediates and then subsequent an hour and a half later for my advanced group uh, by Zoom. How do you play table tennis in a group with a group session with teenagers um, on uh, online and on video? And how many did you have on? Uh, had five in each group. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, Odd number as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can get a bit of creativity. You can do that, and Zoom has been uh, absolutely fantastic for that. And the other bit of technology that I think is most most impactful that I use, even though I use some heavier tech, um, flip chart and pen. Yep. Good. Good. Those but are the two that make the biggest difference in my in my armory in your armory great stuff okay next so, I've gone lo- so i've gone low tech on you. L- low tech on it hey low tech i, I like that I'm always breaking the rules again hey colin <laughs> you, well that's a little bit of that <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if if you were to win the lottery how would you spend your money uh so if i won the lottery tomorrow i would number one use the first bit of the money and pay off any debt including any mortgage on a house so i'll get get myself out of debt don't like um you know, as I say, I'm not, not so good with finance. You know, if one of the worries is going to get me, it's probably financial. Um, and just a principle of not owning anyone anything, being independent, being, um, yeah, not being dependent, being independently robust. Um, so I'd pay off any debts. Then the next thing I would do is put it away for two years. And then the next thing I would do is have a meeting with myself in six months' time to check that I'm still on the right plan. And at that point, I might have more idea of yeah. what sensibly to do, but I think the worst thing you can do is tell people about it. And I think this, even if even if you're going to do good and wonderful things with it, you know, I can't see that I can't see what the benefit of telling other people about it would be. Mm-hmm. I think if I'm going to create some good out of this, then I need to really think this through properly, without any without the noise of all of that fame and stuff. So. Uh, that's what I do. Okay, good stuff. Okay, I'm going to keep firing them at you. So sharpen these up then. Um, I've got a question here. Y- you mentioned the business athlete principles. What do you do to help you perform at your best in terms of your physical and emotional well-being? Values. Connect with my own values. I would uh, just remove myself from any ex- – I'm quite extroverted. Remove myself from any extroversion. Just go somewhere quiet, you know, meditationally. Uh, remind myself who I am, irrespective of what's going on in the world. And then typically what I'd do, I'd think about who are the important people. Everyone in the room, every, you know, the, I'm, the situation I'm going to go into, yeah. in that situation I'm going to go into, everyone in the room, metaphorically or physically, is sacred. So I need to stand in the shoes of every individual that represents whatever stakeholders there are and look around from their position and imagine some you make some mistakes but imagine their needs their motivations uh, what success looks like for them Um, so just get a feel in their shoes then i think what you do you look at the relationships between them and then the key themes that are likely to arise and likely to develop in the system Um, and then from that point i think uh, what you can do is to um, is to play a play a role in contributing to positive dynamics that moves things forward 
Great. Wow, powerful stuff. Okay, my, my next question is one of my favorites. So I'll see how you go with this one. Is um, What advice would you give to your teenage self? Get some advice, some, get some advice from someone five years earlier. <laughs> back to my back to my don't start too late right um philosophy so um yeah if i was my teenage self i'd say you don't get this advice when you're 10 um, right. and i think there's something there's something in my history about that that's um when i was 12 i didn't really understand about mental approaches and what have you and physical yeah. technical you know i learned technical technical and philosophical from pete i learned mental from listening to brian tracy tapes when i was in my early 20s yeah. you know and then what, what i want to do is to help the, the 12 year olds to know what i it, it took me to 20 i was 22 years of age uh, to learn and so um so my advice is get into the adult learning principles you know that we that we talk about as early as you can and just play with them. You haven't got to go with the long words or anything, but get into an interest in the way that the mind works, into neurology, psychology, etc., um, and learn how you operate at an early age, That's just really in some fun. ways. Don't wait, don't wait until you're in your 20s to do adult learning. Brilliant. Do it now. Well, Colin, it, it, it's, I'm drawing us to a close here now. I, and I've just been fascinating hearing your story, uh, the highs and the lows, the, the aspects of your, your business, um, the career path you've gone on, but also hearing a lot of humble, personal, insightful stuff around your family and what you've done with, with your life. And also, you know, really given some inspiration as to, you know, the possibility going forward as well, which I, I often and always get from you. I, my last question would always be, um, Whose sports story would you really like to hear? <laughs> okay, I just want to help out where I can. But uh, whose sports story? Um, give me just a second. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to. I'd like to know more. I'd like to. I'd like to have dinner with Roger Federer because he was a uh, Roger Federer was uh, was wasn't the finished article for quite some time i'd like to know more about his story and what made him like he was when he was younger and what changed him when he got older and i know there are stories around that but um yeah but i'd like to actually hear that yeah in person so in terms about, of yeah something about not being the finished article and who is now the finished article and the journey uh, yeah and what and what happened what happened to uh, to get on the the path that that to greatness if you like yeah. uh, in terms of uh, someone in uh, let's say in british sport i would love you to uh, do one of these or i would like to go out and have dinner with um dave collins sports psychologist yeah. and you know the the uh, who, someone who really really knows their evidence base really knows their stuff uh is a mentor to hundreds and hundreds of uh, of sports scientists of many disciplines and um and how they use what they know academically and how they apply it practically and how they apply it through others that they mentor. So Dave's, Dave's a, a bit of a legend and, uh, and uh, he's very generous with his time with, with others and with, has been with me. And I talked to him not long ago, just after he was done something important with Chelsea, I think, or something, right. and um, football. And, uh, and that was nice of him. But I'd, uh, I'd, like, to, I'd like to get the opportunity to, to find out more. I'll see what I can do, Colin. Let's see if we can get him on uh, onto a podcast to hear his, his story and his insights because, you know, not dissimilar to yourself, there is value and there is, um, you know, gold dust or gems within everybody's story. And I, I really hope that the listeners from today's story, hearing your journey, who's been really honest and open and humble in what you've shared, I'm sure there'll be many nuggets which people can take away from, from what you've shared. So I'd just like to really thank you for that. I know my pleasure. Uh, th this is something that we've spoken about in the past. We both come from a place of being developers of others and helpers of other people, helping them to aspire to be the very best that they can be and fulfilling their potential. Mm -hmm. So I, I mm -hmm. really hope what we've pulled together today and the conversation we've had will uh, both inspire, but will also challenge and help people really think about what they do and how they do it. So I'd just like to end this off there, Colin, saying thank you. And um, just before we do close down, though, would you like to possibly give any uh, sort of details of how people might be able to follow your journey in the future? Should they, should they be interested to make contact or see what you do? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just message me um, if you want to, uh, to get in touch. Uh, you can email me, obviously. And, uh, and uh, if you just look, look me up on Facebook, you see some of my everyday stuff going on. 
and uh, and that would include me personally and, and uh, the way that I communicate with uh, with friends as well as the, my professional stuff and of course we've got Corby Smash Table Tennis which has got its own Facebook page and I often sort of um, you know re regurgitate some of the things that are coming out of there um, yeah and happy to chat to, happy to chat to people well I'd encourage people to make contact with you because as I said I've learned a lot from you throughout the years um, and you've inspired me and you've always always made me really think so uh, on that <laughs> note thanks Colin really enjoy your time today my uh, pleasure look after yourself take care it helps someone somewhere so there we have it the sports story of Colin Wilson his journey from riding his bike through to being an international table tennis player and now a high-performing coach, consultant and people developer. Colin is never shy of sharing his views and insights, which come with a powerful intent to help others develop and perform. Colin always makes me think. So, the conversation today made me really reflect on many things, including what information would I have liked to have known earlier in my life and career. So the questions I would like to pose to you to think about today are as follows. What do you believe to be true that may not be helping you? Also, who might you ask to help challenge those beliefs and assumptions that you have? It's been great having you with me on the podcast. I hope you have enjoyed it and it's made you think. Please follow us on social media if you're keen not to miss any of our great shows. From me, Dave Levine, look after yourself and I look forward to having you with me on the next show.